150 people become homeless every day in Los Angeles County. They consider us criminals. That's the way it is. We do need help. We need a lot of help out here. They don't want us to be seen. We are people too. Despite record spending statewide to address the crisis, it's only getting worse and people are frustrated. It's crazy, we have heroin overdoses all over the streets here. My wife is actually uh, scared to go out and walk on the street. Almost it's not, it's not a crime. We're not, we're not blaming the victims here, but the fact is though, the city has to get control of the situation. No test city, no test city. Compounding the crisis, there is often stiff resistance to some solutions. Hold on, hold on. You need to stop pushing it down our throat. Oh my God, we are driving past homeless people and we are not seeing them. That is the end of our humanity. This is a crisis. We are in almost like a war. So how did we get here? And what can we do now? I'm Pat Harvey. I'm Hermel Aragawi. I'm Jeff Michael. I'm DeMarco Morgan. Tonight, in-depth reporting on this important issue as CBS NLA presents Breaking Point, California's homeless crisis. LA has always had a skid row, but now it feels like there are skid rows all over Southern California. People are frustrated. People are upset. People are at the breaking point. Ooh, ooh. When did all of this become normal? A homeless camp in the Sepulveda Basin exploding? Flames 50 feet high. It's an extremely hazardous area. In Mar Vista, gunmen shooting up a homeless camp. It's just out of control. I'm beginning not to feel safe. In Venice, a man renting a fleet of beat up old vans parked in front of people's homes for the homeless to sleep in. These folks have no place to use the bathroom. In Van Nuys, a homeless man breaking into a store and watching porn on a computer while the family was living upstairs. What did they kill him? Then I grabbed him and slammed him to the ground. In Anaheim, a massive tent city with a secret underground bunker filled with hundreds of stolen bicycles. Above ground, trash and drugs. I definitely found needles thrown over our fence a bunch. Hey, thanks for dropping them off. And in San Pedro, a homeless man dumped at a bus stop. He was driven there by police from another city. I was just appalled. And when did it become acceptable to live in fear? Like in Garden Grove, where a homeless camp opened in a shopping mall parking lot. We're leaving. It's just, it just feels unsafe. Super frustrated. Many times they try to sit there and say, can't you just arrest them? It doesn't work that way. Or in mid-city LA, where homeless people brawl in the streets night after night right outside people's homes. My wife is actually uh, scared to go out and walk on the street. Or in Long Beach, where a homeless man beat a woman to death with a scooter. The detective said that was the worst thing he ever seen. The camps, the trash, the crime, the record spending to resolve it all. Yet the crisis is still growing. That's why we're at the breaking point. And nowhere is it more visible and more disturbing than Skid Row, filled with despair, drugs, disease, streets so foul the city sprays them with bleach. 4,000 people, more than ever before, living and dying on Skid Row. These folks are not living on the sidewalk, they are dying on the sidewalk. Estela Lopez runs a private security and sanitation patrol in downtown LA. Hundreds of store owners pay for it because they say the city has lost control of the streets. Prostitution is rampant, human oh. trafficking. If you are in charge of this city, when did this become normal? Each week, her crews collect tons of trash, hundreds of needles, and even dead rats. Store owners are fed up. I think uh, we need to get more support from the city because I don't feel they're doing enough. It's a humanitarian crisis. Reverend Andy Bales runs the Union Rescue Mission on Skid Row. They feed and house thousands a day, more than ever. We need to act right now and get people under a roof. We have left so many people on the streets for so long. We have really a devastated generation. Ask him if we're at the breaking point, and he'll tell you, we are way, way past it people are dying. We had almost a thousand people die last year. 
how can we live with ourselves? You can hear the outrage in people's voices. How could the crisis get so bad? I sat down with LA Mayor Eric Garcetti and asked him that question. Our conversation later in this report. A frightening reality of the homeless crisis. Crime is up, way up. We'll explore why and look at the impact as Breaking Point, California's homeless crisis continues. The homeless crisis has created an alarming situation across Southern California. Crimes committed by homeless people and against homeless people are way up. A father stabbed in the neck at dinner with his wife and young daughter. Oh, I got gasped. A utility worker murdered on his way home. This is my dad, but this could be your dad. A local tailor is shoved under a moving truck. Police say his attacker is this man, Garrett Joseph Bolt, a homeless man. In fact, they say all of these recent random and horrific attacks and dozens more like them were committed by a homeless person. There is no doubt in anybody's mind that this has reached and gone beyond the crisis. The LAPD just started tracking homeless-related crimes. Their numbers show violent crimes committed by the homeless jumped nearly 30% in the last year. Few cases were as horrific as the one that rocked the Oceanfront Tourist District of Ventura. He was married with the baby and working. He's doing really good. He was just a really good guy, you know, the stuff I got. <laughs> Becky Mealy recently spoke exclusively to CBSN Los Angeles about the brutal attack that took her oldest son's life and, as she says, destroyed her family. This was just unbelievable, you know. You're inside a restaurant, somebody come and stab you. I mean, you think, okay, someone come up to you, uh, but with a knife to stab you? Anthony Mealy was just finishing up dinner at the Aloha Steakhouse with his wife and five-year-old daughter. That's when investigators say 49-year-old Jamal Jackson, a homeless man, walked up to his table and stabbed Mealy in the neck. Police say he has a long criminal record, including felony statutory rape, felony burglary, domestic violence, and multiple arrests for public drunkenness, a criminal history that dates back to the 90s. His public defender also says he has a history of mental illness. But according to our research, Jackson is in the minority. We searched the records of a dozen homeless people suspected in the most recent horrific attacks. None had extensive criminal histories. Forensic neuropsychologist Dr. Judy Ho believes three factors can lead a homeless person to become violent. The constant stress of trying to survive on the street, Homelessness is a stressor. It can be a traumatizing stressor. The longer they stay there, the more potential they might have to experience other forms of trauma. Pair that with untreated mental illness and possible drug use. But if they're also struggling with alcohol and substance use issues, then that really comes into the picture as well because not only does it make certain mental illnesses worse in terms of their presentation, but they won't be able to make good decisions when they're intoxicated. There might be an open delusion they're having, a hallucination that they're having. They will say that in that moment, they heard a voice saying that you have to kill this person in front of you. Commander Donald Graham is the LAPD's homeless coordinator. He says that with the long-term homeless, even small disputes can lead to sudden violence. A squabble over a space to put your tent quickly escalates into an assault with a deadly weapon situation. And without shelter, more and more the homeless are becoming victims. Violent crimes against the homeless is up nearly 37 percent from this time last year. There are people out there who are victimizing these homeless people. They understand the nature of the condition. They understand the vulnerable position that they're in. The gangs run Skid Row. The Reverend Andy Bales of Union Rescue Mission says gangs use drugs, violence, and sex to control the most vulnerable demographic. Gang enterprise 
drug trafficking, sex trafficking, backed by violence. Women dressing up as men to avoid an assault. Men are being assaulted. People are dying. Violence against the homeless, violence committed by the homeless getting much worse with devastating results. The longer we leave people on the streets, the more danger all of us are in. The experts we talk to say there's only one way to address this issue. Get people off the streets and into shelters where they can get help and protection. Unless we do that, they say, we will all be increasingly vulnerable while on the street. I'm Hermel Aragawi in Hollywood. Want to solve the homeless crisis? We also have to solve our state's out of control housing crisis. You'll see why that may be an even tougher challenge as Breaking Point, California's homeless crisis continues. For generations, owning a home has been part of the California dream. But for millions today, finding affordable housing has become a nightmare. Our housing crisis is out of control, and it's one of the big reasons we have a homeless crisis. 130,000 people now live on the street in the Golden State. From this former nurse living in a tent on Skid Row. It's bad. To this former engineer living in an RV in West L.A. They consider us criminals. To the Lopez family living in a motel room in Mission Hills, paid for by L.A. County. We just got out of Skid Road. We are blessed to be with the L.A. housing. There are a lot of reasons people end up on the streets, but in California, the top reason is money. There simply aren't enough homes and apartments that people can afford. It has to be tackled. It is a legitimate crisis in the state. We're losing the middle class. Governor Newsom is pushing cities to build 3.5 million new homes in six years. But some say that's impossible because of a standoff in California now between the haves and the have-nots. Right now, you've got a large number of very wealthy single-family homeowners who feel no sense of obligation to the next generation to build more housing. It's almost as if they've got theirs and they're pulling up the ladder. Richard McDonald represents a developer who wants to turn this vacant office building on South Los Robles Avenue in Pasadena into condos. Sounds simple enough, right? The planning department and the city manager approved the project. Then it came here to Pasadena City Hall for public comment and a final vote by the city council. And that's when this project ran into a buzzsaw. You cannot move this project forward till you have ensured our community safety and livability. We kind of feel that our neighborhood is under attack. We, we have massive development from all sides. I am just basically terrified. Why are people angry? Pasadena wanted to restrict the building to five stories and 70 units, with six units reserved for lower income families. But under a new state law designed to encourage more housing, the developer could build six stories and 91 units if he built eight lower income units. One more story for just two more low income units. Neighbors hated the deal. We've paid a lot of money to live here. We've raised our family here. This is our community. I am not gonna cry. This is totally the haves versus the have not. The opposition came mostly from people who live here in the city's Madison Heights neighborhood. Tree-lined, single-family, multi-million dollar homes. After a contentious hearing that went well past midnight, the council voted to kill the project, defying state law. Sacramento passes this well-intentioned, but I think misguided legislation. That tiny increment of additional housing, five hours worth of public debate, tremendous acrimony. So the developer now plans to sue the city for violating state law. It creates a no-win situation at the local level. The city council wants to abide by, by the rule of law, but in some instances, there's so much pressure, it's so intense. The mayor says the real issue here is the state trying to bigfoot cities. He says Pasadena has built more than its fair share of dense and affordable housing and says this is not about nimbyism, but a clumsy state power grab. One size fits all and not recognizing or making any distinction between the cities that have made an honest effort to do their part and cities that haven't done anything 
is really misdirected and inappropriate. But don't expect Sacramento to back down. Lawmakers are pushing for more laws to allow denser neighborhoods around mass transit, state rent control, and even a plan to take over all zoning from cities and towns. It's really uh, warfare on an epic scale. I think it's really a struggle for the soul of California. So will people accept denser neighborhoods in their neighborhoods? Or will our housing crisis continue to fuel our homeless crisis? I'm Jeff Michael reporting from Pasadena. Long Beach doesn't have 10 cities on its streets and its homeless numbers are much better than most cities. We'll explore why next as Breaking Point California's homeless crisis continues. The city of LA is spending a record amount on the homeless crisis, but it keeps getting worse. 36,000 people live on the streets right now, more than ever. I went to City Hall to ask the mayor what's going on. To me, this is the humanitarian crisis of our lives. We're trying to get more places for clean and bad. LA Mayor Eric Garcetti is leading the largest homeless response in the city's history. Billions being spent to help tens of thousands off the street. But critics, and there are many, question his leadership and results. In Koreatown, thousands marched in the streets to block his plans for an emergency shelter in Council President Herb Wesson's district. Hearings at City Hall turned to shouting matches. You need to stop pushing it down our throat. Oh my God, we're driving past homeless people and we're not seeing them. After five months, both sides have finally agreed on a site. Hey, hold on, hold on. And in Venice, hundreds push back on a shelter there. It will be built, but months behind schedule. The mayor calls them bridge shelters, trailers and tent compounds placed on city-owned land. This is the first one near Olvera Street, downtown. Social workers, food, and beds for about 80 people. The mayor promised last year dozens would be open by now. So far, only four of these facilities have opened with 220 beds, and they have 36,000 homeless people. Of those four that are open, they've been runaway successes. Crime's gone down, and they're providing a solution in those neighborhoods. And I guarantee you that you will see another 20 of those open in the next 12 months. There was, I know, like some feces on the sidewalk. The mayor created a special team of city workers to patrol outside the shelters. We're making a deal with communities. The deputy mayor for homeless services told us there are less tents, less trash, and less crime in this part of Hollywood now. All right, man, good to see you. <laughs> Progress, but critics say painfully slow. By far, the mayor's most expensive plan is to build something called permanent supportive housing. Shelters like this one going up near Skid Row. Individual rooms, mental health, addiction treatment, health care. Three years ago, voters approved a $1.2 billion tax hike to build 10,000 units. But instead of 10,000, LA will only build about half that number. Construction has become so expensive, half a million dollars per room, the city is running out of money. I want to get you on record saying the money that we do have, to spend it in a more efficient way. I think it's a misconception. We've got 110 projects, fully funded, broken ground or, and or about to open. Permit supportive housing doesn't get built right. in three months. But the city council has now stepped in, taking the last 100 million left in the fund to build cheaper, faster shelters using things like shipping containers. The mayor insists his plans are working. They just need more time and more money and more support from LA County, the state and the feds. This fight requires that we stick with this, that we not lose our momentum, that we not lose our commitment. If we don't all take this on, we can point fingers about who caused it, who's responsible, but it won't get solved without all of us together. I talked to the mayor for over an hour, going deep on the homeless crisis and his responses to it. If you'd like to see more of our conversation, go to CBSLA.com. We've posted an in-depth piece. I'm Pat Harvey, reporting from Skid Row. The latest homeless count showed big increases in most cities across California, but not in Long Beach. The homeless population here rose only 2%. As Long Beach figured out how to effectively respond to the homeless crisis, we came here to find out. The tents, 
The carts, the encampments. As the cost of living continues to soar, the homeless population climbs right along with it, pretty much everywhere, except in Long Beach. I think we have a strategic plan, and I think that we are relentless on the issue. After a 12% increase last year, there are now nearly 60,000 homeless people in L.A. County. In contrast, Long Beach, with a population of nearly 500,000 people, they only saw a 2% increase. It's improving because there's a lot of resources out there. So what are they doing that everyone else isn't? I sat down with Mayor Robert Garcia to find out. How are you doing it and what are you doing exactly to make it work? We are in no way reactive to the homelessness challenge in Long Beach. We're very proactive. It is on top of mind every single day at City Hall. I think we're certainly getting a lot right. And it's not that there aren't folks that are experiencing homelessness here, because there are. I think first is building housing that's affordable uh, for seniors, for low-income families, and that's hard to do. We're also implementing a variety of protections to help people stay in their homes. We have a street outreach network that goes out and engages people in the community that may not have come to the center on their own. It helped out for a lot of people that's a need. Uh -huh. you know, and I'm a need. And in Long Beach, the On the Street Outreach Network has a wide net. The fire department has formed the HART team. The police department has the Quality of Life team. And they both work hand in hand with the Health and Human Services Department. We always want to make sure as we're engaging the homeless population that we're doing two main things, which is offering resources and making sure we're doing the proper referrals so we can adequately meet the needs of each person we engage on the street. With this program, we're able to turn our hat around from firefighter paramedic to outreach worker, and we're able to refer these people to services here in town. So you guys work together. This is almost unheard of in many of the cities who are dealing with these big crises. What's your advice for cities like LA? Does it take a team? Does it take a village? I'd say absolutely. It makes no sense to stay siloed within your own organization. But working together collaboratively, all the different organizations coming together, coming up with a plan and how we can assist each other to, to resolve the issue. Desire, teamwork and commitment. Long Beach is putting in the work and getting results. Mayor Garcia says he is concerned about rising rents and the lack of affordable housing. We need to build more housing is what he told me. Just accepting the status quo is not going to work anymore. In Long Beach, I'm DeMarco Morgan. Thank you for watching this special presentation from CBSN Los Angeles. We have created a special web page on the homeless crisis. It has a resource guide and lots of bonus video. It's all at CBSLA.com. I'm DeMarco Morgan.